morning. Let me thank you first by attend for attending the Texas Public Policy Foundation's 14th Annual Policy Orientation. My name is Kathleen Hunker. I am a senior policy analyst with the Center for Economic Freedom, and I'll be moderating this panel, Do Property Rights Help the Poor Affordable Housing in Texas? For anyone interested in live tweeting today's event, the hashtag is TXPO2016. We at the Texas Public Policy Foundation often praise what is called the Texas model, the combination of low taxes, low spending, limited regulation that has powered the state's economic engine to new speeds of growth and prosperity and job creation. The praise is well deserved. Texas claims 73% of the total non-farm job growth in the U.S. over the last 15 years. Residents in Texas also make 67% more in adjusted wages than the national average. Because affordability refers to the relationship between income and price, the opportunity for more revenue streams and low cost of living means that more products and services are within reach for everyday Texans. We see this quite clearly in the Texas housing market. According to the Real Estate Center at Texas A&M, Texas historically ranks among the most affordable housing markets in the country. Even today, with a growing population, the state as a whole has an affordability index value of 1.71, which means that the state's median income is 1.71 times higher than the amount required to qualify for a mortgage on a medium-priced home. But that said, no matter how successful an economy is, there will always be those who struggle. And in light of the costs and investment involved, that struggle is often most readily apparent in the housing market, where costs can regularly approach 30% of a household salary. The Homeless Research Institute identified nearly 30,000 Texans sleeping in emergency shelters and transitional housing outside or in places not meant for human habitation. Nearly half a million Texans face what the industry calls a severe housing cost burden and are deemed at risk for homelessness. In addition, the U.S. Census Bureau reveals that 27% of homeowners and 48% of renters are or, at abo or above the threshold where it becomes financially infeasible to absorb an increased housing costs without a subsequent change in lifestyle. This last group, by the way, is your middle class who have a decent salary, are not at risk for homelessness, but still prove sensitive to market trends. More importantly, and what I'm sure has driven most of you into this room today, is that housing and rental prices have risen over the last few years in key parts of the state. They have in fact done so at rates far faster than either income and inflation. The business model centered on homes price for $150,000 has faded, while some cities report a gap in the between the supply of low-end market units and the demand within the city. There is consequently a good deal of concern that the Titan market could exact a painful toll on Texans, uh, particularly those who are already faltering under their housing needs. Voices have been quick to blame Texas's population growth, and do not get me wrong, that certainly does play a part, but so have land use regulations and the inclination of Texas cities, which have interpreted the surge in population as a starter pistol for more regulations, rather than letting the free market innovate and adapt. Studies have shown that land use regulations can inflate costs between 25 and 50 percent, and while there are occasional public health safety concerns promulgated by land use regulations, they can also impede the addition of new housing stock on the market. So what does this mean for Texans trying to provide for their families? How should the legislature and city councils respond? What can Texans expect if the inclination and current trends do not recede? Well, we've assembled a panel to discuss those very questions. Over the next few minutes, uh, you'll hear uh, from a collection of experts on the initiatives that the legislature has taken <coughs> on housing affordability over the last few sessions, and perhaps the proposals the legislature should adopt in the near future. You'll hear about the economic theory behind land use regulations and the different ways that it can create artificial scarcity and drive up price and lower supply. Finally, you'll hear local experts explain some of the costs that are attended to the most common regulations in Austin and other cities throughout the state 
and whether or not these regulations have impeded the objective of providing safe, adequate, and affordable housing for all Texans. Each panelist has 14 minutes, and if there is time at the end, I will certainly open it up for Q&A. Unfortunately, our first speaker, Representative uh, Bernal, was not able to make it today. He had to testify in South Texas last minute. So we're going to move to our next speaker on the agenda, which is Randall O'Toole. Mr. O'Toole is a senior fellow with the Cato Institute with an expertise in land use and transportation policy. He has written numerous papers and five books critiquing government policy and planning, including Gridlock, Why We're Stuck in Traffic and What to Do About It, and American Nightmare, How Government Undermines Dream of Home Ownership. Uh, Mr. O'Toole is well versed with policy orientation. He spoke at a panel earlier uh, yesterday as well as last year, and we look forward to hearing the discussion he brings to the table. Mr. O'Toole. You know, uh, for a long time, people seem to think that uh, human rights and property rights were in conflict with one another, and that property rights favored the rich and hurt the poor. But I think we're going to see in the next few years that there's going to be a confluence between property rights and uh, rights of low-income people, and it's going to bring together an interesting coalition aimed at uh, restoring property rights and restoring affordable housing throughout the country. Uh, I live in Oregon, and I've grow lived in Oregon all my life, and Oregon now has a rule that 98% of the state is zoned rural, and if you live in a rural area, you're not allowed to build a house on your own land unless you own at least 80 acres, you actually farm it, and depending on soil productivity, you earn forty dollars to $80,000 a year from farming it in two of the last three years. The planners are proud of the fact that since they implemented these rules uh, about 20 years ago, they've only had to issue about 100 building permits a year in rural areas. So all, virtually all new growth in Oregon has had to be in an urban area. California is a little different, uh, but they have a different set of rules, and their rules are even stricter. As a result of these rules, 95% of all Californians are confined to living in 5% of the state. And that is the, the uh, most restrictive of any state in the country. It's the densely, most densely packed urban areas. Uh, of course, New York City is very dense, but for the urban areas as a whole in New York State, uh, they're not as dense as the urban areas in California because of this severe land use restriction that has made housing terribly unaffordable. So just as a, uh, a typical example, what's the price of a four-bedroom, two-bath home on a large lot with a two-car garage in a neighborhood that would be suitable for an a, a, a up-and-coming middle management family, you know, a family of a middle manager? Uh, the Coldwell Banker answers this question each year, and in 2015, they said in San Antonio, that house would be about $204,000, whereas in Portland, that house would be $400,000, almost exactly twice as much. In California, uh, San Jose, double it again, $800,000. In uh, San Francisco, almost double again, one point, almost $1.4 million. So... <clears throat> We look at around in Texas and we find Austin is almost as unaffordable as Portland, but then you look at uh, De uh, Houston and Dallas-Fort Worth and they're just about as affordable as San Antonio. Uh, housing affordability is measured, one way of measuring it is by dividing the median home price by the median family income. If it's uh, two or three, a house is pretty affordable. You can get a loan and pay it off. Uh, without burdening your income that much uh, in, in 15 to 20 years. If it's four, it's becoming unaffordable. If it's more than four, it's definitely unaffordable, and most of the people in your area are not going to be able to own their own homes. So you can see in Portland is four, Austin is uh, almost three, Houston, uh, Dallas, San Antonio are closer to two. Of course, California, we're talking eights, sevens, eights, nines. Uh, as far as uh, uh, median home or value to income ratios. Not only does this land use regulation make housing less affordable, it makes housing prices more volatile, which makes it more risky that if you buy your house at the wrong time, when you want to sell it, it's going to be worth a lot less. 
We're all familiar with pictures of the housing bubbles that took place in 2008. California has actually gone through three housing bubbles before that. They're going through another one now. You can see we've got uh, uh, housing prices are rising rapidly in, in places with urban growth uh, management. But you go to come to Texas and places like that, and the exact same chart looks like this. There's really no bubble. If we hadn't had states like California and Florida and Oregon uh, with these kind of land use rules, there would have been no housing bubble in the last uh, in, in the mid 2000s, which means there would have been no financial crash. The financial crash is essentially due to urban planners. It's not due to the subprime loans. It's not due to low interest rates from the Federal Reserve. Uh, those things existed in, in uh, North Carolina and, and Texas and Oklahoma and, and uh, Nebraska, and yet those places did not have housing bubbles. You only had housing bubbles where you had uh, lots of land use regulation. Now, you'd think that the Supreme Court would make this regulation, un declare this regulation unconstitutional because we have the Fifth Amendment that has traditionally been interpreted to mean that you can't take away pre people's property rights for public use without compensation, and you can't take away people's property rights for private use with or without compensation. But the Supreme Court has made some decisions that have severely weakened that rule. And I just want to talk about a couple of those decisions. One, the first was in 1926, they made a decision that legitimized zoning. It was for a town in uh, Ohio called Euclid. So it's called the Euclid decision. And it said zoning is a legitimate police power of the state to prevent nuisances, like uh, somebody put a gravel pit next door to you, or if somebody put in a, a tannery next door to you. That would be a nuisance. And so they said zoning is a good way to pre prevent that. Well, that's sort of okay, but then in 1978, they came up with a decision regarding Grand Central Terminal in New York City. Uh, the owner wanted to build a skyscraper on top of it without changing the terminal. It turns out the terminal was originally designed, was originally planned to have a skyscraper on top of it, but they never got around to building it. But now they're losing money on their trains, they're losing money on the terminal. So they said, well, if we build some office space up here, we'll be able to make money. And the, the city said, nope, that's a historic building. You can't change it. So they took him to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court said, oh, it doesn't have to be a nuisance. Uh, anytime the government wants to take away your property rights through regulation, they can as long as they leave some value behind for you. Of course, the company, by that time they made the decision, had already gone bankrupt in the largest bankruptcy in American history, Penn Central. Uh, but that didn't change the Supreme Court's mind. And so that legitimized all kinds of regulation for historic purposes, to pre preserve farmlands, to uh, require everybody to have front porches on their houses because supposedly we're more neighborly if we have front porches. Uh, and you know all kinds of weird rules are being passed under this rule. Then there's the famous infamous Kelo decision where uh, the city wanted to take away land from a owners of a working class neighborhoods and give it to a developer who would build an upper middle class neighborhood because it would produce more property tax revenue for the city. And the Supreme Court said, well, normally we don't allow something like this for private use, but this isn't private use. The city's going to get more property tax revenue, so that's a public use. And so uh, essentially they're saying, we're going to take away affordable housing and put in less affordable housing, and that's going to incre increase our revenues. Of course, as you may know, the development never got built. Suzette Kilo lost her house, and all her neighbors lost their houses, and it's now a dump because uh, nobody wanted to build there. But uh, the Supreme Court said they can go ahead and do it. So now, this, the, uh, as the Supreme Court interprets the Constitution, you can take away private property through regulation without compensation, and you can take away property for private use with compensation. Uh, that, those are terrible rulings. The Cato Institute has called the Penn Central ruling one of the worst, 12 worst Supreme Court rulings in history. That, the book they wrote on that was before the Kelo decision. I think they would have added Kelo to that if they had uh, written the book a little bit later. We can see that about a dozen and a half states have growth management laws that restrict housing, housing construction. And if you look at where housing was expensive in the uh, 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 recent, well, actually, this is right now. This is uh, uh, value to income ratios right now. And you can see there's a lot of coral strong correlation between where you've got the rules and you've got the unaffordable housing. And there's been a lot of research that you can point to by academics showing that 
there's a, a definite correlation between this kind of planning and housing on affordability. Well, it so happens the Supreme Court made another decision last June in a case called the Texas Department of Housing versus the Inclusionary Communities uh, Project. And in this case, uh, it, it had to do with the Fair Housing Act, which, of course, President Johnson signed in 1968, uh, almost 50 years ago. The Fair Housing Act made it illegal to treat people differently. Oops, that didn't work out right. That's supposed to say disparate treatment, it's to treat people differently based on race, uh, sex, religion, and things like that. But uh, some people have said, well, if you, if you just say, I won't sell you a house because you're black, well, that violates the Fair Housing Act. But what if we said, uh, I won't sell houses to people who smoke? And what if it turned out, it turns out it's not true, but I've been using this example for a while. What if it turned out that blacks were more likely to smoke than whites? Well, then if you have a no smoking rule in your housing sales or rentals, then uh, you potentially have a disparate impact. This is supposed to say disparate impact on blacks. It turns out blacks actually smoke less than white, so I'm going to have to come up with a new analogy here. Uh, but uh, uh, the point is, it's based on the effect of your rules, and it might not be intentional at all, but uh, the Supreme Court said, uh, because of unintentional rules, you can still end up violating the Fair Housing Act. Now, the Cato Institute and other groups opposed this ruling in the Supreme Court in an amicus brief, but the Supreme Court nevertheless decided that disparate impact was an appropriate doctrine. So what does that mean? Well, the Department of Housing and Urban Development put out rules for disparate impact last year, and the rules have two kinds of disparate impacts. One is loans. If, you're passing, if you loan money to people and you draw a line around a district and say, well, we're not going to loan here, and it so happens that it has a lot of low-income minorities living in that district, well, that's a disparate impact. And the other is land use rules and ordinances. So uh, there's a process. If, if any city that passes a, pol a land use policy has to undergo three tests, does the land use policy make housing more expensive? If so, can that policy be justified based on some other social goal, like uh, reducing air pollution? And if so, is there a better way of achieving that policy that has a less discriminatory effect? If, if a, a policy fails any of those tests or all of those tests, then uh, it has disparate impact and that policy violates the Fair Housing Act. So urban growth boundaries, to me, violate the Fair Housing Act. They should be all made uh, abandoned. A policy called inclusionary zoning, where you mandate the developers dedicate 15 or 20 percent of their homes to uh, low-income people. That violates the Fair Housing Act because it ends up with developers building fewer homes. And the homes that they build are more expensive to compensate for the ones that they have to give up to sell for below cost. Uh, rent control, uh, similarly, it, it provides a few people with low, income, low rent and everybody else has to pay more. Uh, Suzette Kilo's case, where they're taking away low-income housing to put in high-income housing, that violates the Fair Housing Act. So all of these things are violations of property rights, well, rent control. All of these things violate property rights, but they also uh, make housing more expensive, and they make it harder for uh, uh, low-income people to rent or buy homes. Ironically, people don't know this, 120 years ago, low-income urbanites were three times more likely to own their own home than high-income urbanites. Since then, we've imposed all kinds of zoning rules to make housing more uh, desirable for the high-income people, but it's made it less affordable for the low-income people. Um, <clears throat> one of the significant effects is that uh, in many communities, that are growing, the black population is declining. And the black population is kind of an indicator because they are unfortunately uh, have a, stuck with a high poverty rate. So San Francisco, I consider to be the most racist community in the United States because the, the population grew by something like 10% uh, and the black population declined by 10%, 11%. Uh, the most racist community in, uh, in Texas is Austin. The, the, the overall population grew by uh, something like 60%. The, 
the black population only grew by 29%. So the, although the black population grew, the disparity in growth was much larger. Whereas, as you can see, Houston and Dallas, the black population actually grew faster than the white population. So uh, we can use the disparate impact to change things. The way the Department of Housing and Urban Development is using it is they're trying to impose high-density housing in neighborhoods of uh, single-family homes, as if to say that putting low-income families in cramped apartments with no private, little privacy is fair as long as they're in the same neighborhoods as upper-middle-class people living on single-family homes on large lots. I don't think that's fair. Uh, that kind of housing is actually more expensive than single-family homes. If they really wanted to make housing more affordable, they'd build a lot more single-family homes because on a per square foot basis, they're a lot better. So California is losing the race to Texas, but Texas has got its problems, particularly here in Austin. If you want to stop having those problems, the most important thing you can do is make sure that counties do not have the authority to zone. Uh, making the problem with California is that the counties are not only have the authority to zone, but that zoning is really controlled by the cities, the same as in Oregon. So counties should not have the power to zone. Another thing that's really made Texas affordable is municipal utility districts. And you need to really encourage more districts. Uh, the state has imposed some rules on those districts, and I think it would be better to risk. Uh, some of those districts defaulting than it would be to restrict the, the use of those districts. I talk about almost all these issues except for the disparate impacts, which is a new issue. In my book, American Nightmare, which the Cato Institute published, they sell it for $26. You can buy a Kindle version for $10. If you want my autograph, I've got a few copies here that I'm selling for $20 today. Uh, so Kindle is cheaper. You can also go to the Cato Institute online and I've got a number of papers on this subject that you can download for free. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Jeffrey Tawawa, who became Vice President of Public Policy for the Home Builders Association of Greater Austin in June 2015. In addition to representing the HBA to over 30 municipalities in six counties, Jeffrey also advises the Association's Political Action Committee on strategy and selecting candidates to support. Jeffrey. Well, first off, I just want to thank the Texas Public Policy Foundation for, for hosting this panel. I mean, it's a, it's a big issue for us and, and our industry. Uh, and uh, I think it's an important thing for all Texans to consider, especially as Austin, I think, is such a great example of what not to do. Uh, and of course, you know, we'll get a little bit more, more into that. So uh, in asking the question, do property rights help the poor, especially in regards to affordable housing in Texas, the answer is yes. You're welcome. We, we can all go home now. If, no, no, just uh, it, it, it really has a, a huge, huge impact, and I'll kind of go into the types of impact that it has, but what it really comes down to is it comes down to location, 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 and who the leadership is in our you know, municipal and local governments, and I think Austin, as you'll see, is such a great example of when you put you know, certain individuals in charge who maybe don't quite understand the, the process and how uh, supply versus demand uh, works, uh, it can get out of hand, and you can end up with the affordability crisis uh, like we have today. They say in the recovery process that the first step is admitting you have a problem. Austin, we have a problem, and that problem is affordability. You, you need only to look at just you know every single article that's come out since the city council uh, took power in January to see that that affordability crisis has just gone drastically up in Austin. And, as the city continues to grow and expand, it's actually only getting worse as opposed to, to better. Um, I wanted to show you a couple, couple of slides uh, from my friends at Housing Works. It's a local uh, nonprofit that works on uh, providing uh, subsidized housing, and they have a great policy team that's done a couple infographics. So this is the city of Austin, um, sort of at a, at a glance from a 30,000 foot rate. So the poverty rate, I think this is as of last year, is 17.8%. Uh, the individuals below poverty is 154,172. Median income is roughly around uh, $76,000, uh, and the median home price 
is $322,500. And uh, as you can see, the rent is a, is a little over $1,000. Now, here's uh, what they do with their infographics is they also break them down by districts. So I, here's two particular districts. So this is uh, Northeast Austin. Um, and as you can see, you know, they have 103 subsidized units. One thing I want you to take a look at is that one towards the bottom uh, where you see the cost of living and then the median home price for that section. You'll see just going from District 1 to District 9, it's, it's quite a significant increase that you see. And you're basically going from, you know, the outskirts of the city to the inner parts of the city. And, you know, what, has, what you see happens is, is that um, uh, because of, you know, increased land and demand and the fact that you're dealing with a much smaller space, you know, you start to see a lot of, a lot of increases. Uh, some of the other things that you, that you see is that, you know, when, if you're trying to build in, in District 1, uh, you know, there's still have a lot of open space there and, you know, the zoning is, is you know, relatively easy to build, whereas, you know, you go into to District 9, which is, you know, part of uh, downtown and Terrytown, and you have to deal with things like historical preservation districts and um, you have to deal with going through those boards and commissions and more often than not anything that happens, you know, at a board or commission often gets appealed to council and it just adds, you know, money and money and money. So uh, as Kathleen mentioned, I am the Vice President of Public Policy for the Home Builder Association and, um, you know, well, uh, that's my official title. I'm really more like, like a plumber. Uh, it's my job to, ke to keep the sludge that is the city of Austin moving in some sort of an, an efficient manner. Uh, and, you know, we, I'm supposed to do that so that our members, you know, can build the, the types of homes uh, that we need. Um, so how, do, how did we, we get here? It, it really comes down to a question of, of supply versus demand. Um, from 2000 to 2012, the Austin MSA grew by 570,000 people. And during that time, they only added 84,000 housing units. The uh, Real Estate Council of Austin um, recently did a study and published a paper. And what they discovered is that if we were to just maintain this current uh, environment that, that we're dealing with, um, we'd have to add 69,000 units um, to Austin by 2025. And you know, what, what that means by maintaining our current existing environment, it's the same situation where you, know, you have a house uh, on the market for roughly about 72 hours of the existing stock, and the new stock can't go up uh, fast enough. Uh, my wife and I, we actually just recently um, bought a home on the outskirts of Austin because we can't afford to live inside the city of Austin. Uh, and, uh, you know, we bought it the week of Christmas, uh, which you'd think no one was really looking for a home in Christmas. And we still ended up in a bidding war with six other people. Uh, and, you know, that just tells you the, how significant the, the demand is and how significant it's going to be. Um, at the end of the day, what it really comes down to is we can't build um, fast enough. And, and a lot of it has to do with the city's land use policies and more importantly, the inefficient processes uh, that the city has. Austin's land development code um, has been amended 189 times since 1984 and so it's over 800 pages long. To put that in perspective, the state budget for the state of Texas for the next two years past this session beat it by only 154 pages. And, you know, that's just one piece in the entire puzzle. That's not taking, you know, the environmental regulations that, that apply to, to the building or, more importantly, the building codes and standards and the criteria manuals that, and the rules that often get written after the fact with, with these ordinances. Um, one of the things I'll, I'll talk about is uh, the code next, which is the city of Austin is looking at redoing their, their land development code. Uh, they finally said, you know, it, it really is this bad. So, so let's take a look. And they hired this design firm. And in 2004, they did a, a report. And one of the quotes they had in the report was, the strict limits imposed by the existing code on the number of dwelling units per parcel in the single family zoning and per acre drives up the per unit land costs and is one of the most significant challenge to the provision of affordable housing. Uh, what it comes down to really is that these restrictions aren't just restricting um, developers. Um, they, what it does is it increases the price of the land and you know I have the same, our members still have the same exact challenges as you'll hear from, from Phyllis that she has. The main difference is is that you know our builders and developers can increase their prices to cover those those costs that, that they see. 
Um, but Phyllis has a lot more um, restrictions on her in terms of you know how much she's uh, supposed to pay the the subcontractors and you know that she gets state and federal funding and it becomes this really interesting situation where um, it becomes very difficult to put the type of affordable units that that you see. More importantly, what happened, what the city is is focusing on right, right now is is you'll as you watch the council debate and talk about this, they keep talking about you know we need to build more subsidized affordable units, subsidized affordable units, and what that is is that is a small component to a very very big big part. Um, they're focusing on on the, this bottom end, you know, with the low income people, and what's happening is they're sort of ignoring this uh, place in the middle. Uh, what I like to say are the the dinks, the dual income no kids. And then the, the growing families, people like my wife and I who, you know, if you picked up our home and put it in the middle of the city of Austin, the price would, would almost double. Um, I actually met with the home builder who built it, and they have that exact same floor plan in, in uh, north uh, west Austin, a little bit north of downtown, and it, it was almost double the, the price. And so um, the other thing is that these limits uh, kind of, they restrict a lot of the uses. One of the things that you'll know, look in the city of Austin is they recently had a debate over these things called accessory dwelling units, uh, granny flats. And so it's kind of like a garage apartment and you know, it's kind of a great sort of uh, filler in the housing stock. You know, maybe you're fresh out of college and you know, you want to, you know, live in central Austin, be close to where you work. It's an, an affordable alternative and the city had a huge, huge debate um, over the allowing uh, of this to happen. And it's a debate that, quite frankly, I don't think that they should have even even had because it, it made sense. I mean, the fact is, is that having those units it provides an an another layer to the housing stock uh, and providing another uh, affordable uh, alternative. Uh, uh, um, the Real Estate Council of Austin um, also says um, that, uh, estimates that to actually start addressing the problem, we need to build 100,000 uh, units to address the lack of supply. Um, so you know it, it, it's 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 a really tough thing to to get to um, when you're dealing with the type of codes that we're we're dealing with. One of the things that the city of Austin did is they hired this guy named Paul Zucker with Zucker Systems to come in and say uh, examine the process and and see you know what's going on. Uh, one th and uh, one thing most people don't know is he was actually here in 1984 um, to do a similar study and. Uh, he, he found a lot of problems then, and from his last uh, report, this was a quote in the executive summary, and I'll just read it. It's, While we found many strengths, good features, and processes in the Planning and Development Review Department, we found many areas needing attention. The customer survey we conducted for this study had the most negative scores we have seen in our studies of 170 communities in 31 states. That is a really nice way of saying it was really, really messed up. <laughs> Um, the over 700 pages of that report has 462 recommendations for changes and actions that happen. And you know, let me tell you, that is really just a starting point um, for, for actually addressing the process issue, which adds really a lot more cost um, over time. Uh, I sent an email to a bunch of our members asking me, you know, send me some of the more ridiculous you know, comments and things you've gotten from planning and development services. And one of my personal favorite ones is there was a plan, and I actually had to pull the plan because I, I couldn't believe that this had happened. But uh, they had a delay for three weeks, and then they finally got a comment back. And the comment back was that there was a comma missing between Austin and Texas, and that they had to bump that line below the address line. And then they had to resubmit it. And of course, in that whole process, that was like a six week you know, delay. And so you do the math, if, if you're trying to get this home you know, closed by the end of the year, I mean, that you know, three, four week delay is, is astronomical, I mean, and, and its impact. Uh, and I had another builder who, uh, they, they have this development um, in South Austin and it runs Joyce into a, a uh, railroad. And there was a ditch that's kind of formed in the railroad. Well, the uh, city of Austin said, that the builder had to do a stream restoration on the ditch um, because they felt it was an environmental uh, zone and um, they refused to issue them their, uh, their site plan approval um, without uh, having that stream restoration as part of the project. And so $200,000 later and six months later, they finally got their, their approval and uh, that project obviously is now done, but I mean, you do the math between, I think that they had a little over 60 units on that. You divide it, I mean, you know, it adds a significant amount of cost. And that's just one piece to a huge puzzle. I get phone calls 
day and night from our members about issues happening at development planning services. And I mean, you know, that's just one piece of the pie. I mean, I would encourage anyone who really, you know, wants to examine this issue, just watch a zoning case happen in the city of Austin. If you want to do a zoning, rezoning in the city of Austin, my advice to you, um, I'm not a lawyer, but my advice is don't do it. Uh, because if you do it, you're going to lose a ton of money on it, and you will be lucky if you make it to that zoning um, you know, and actually get what you want. Um, and oftentimes what we find builders and developers do is when they have to rezone, they do it. They build you know, millions and millions of dollars into the cost planning uh, this. And what that does is it creates this atmosphere where they're predicting sort of the worst case scenario every time, and you, know, you end up with a very, very uh, unaffordable uh, product. Okay. Uh, one of the statistics that, that we talk about uh, a lot at the Home Builders Association is uh, this particular one. For every $1,000 increase in the median home price, 1,285 families are priced out of the market. This is um, our National Association of Home Builders actually has selected different housing markets to, to look at this particular type of uh, price. And so, you know, you think about Austin regulations and and how they increase, you know, the prices of a home. Uh, a great example, I think, is is the visitability uh, ordinance, which you know mandates basically that you have to build certain parts of your home to uh, somewhat ADA standards uh, to allow someone in a wheelchair to visit your home. You know, it's a it's an admirable uh, thing to to try and do, but the reality is, is it adds a significant amount of cost um, to it. Especially when you talk about building on different types of topography, you need a no-step entrance, you need a visible exterior route. The first floor has to have a bathroom where you know, they can you know, be able to, to wheel around properly. And so if you're building in, let's say, topography similar to Westlake, where you have lots of hills and rocks, building that exterior route you know, is going to cost you anywhere from eight to $10,000. And so you do the math. If, if you're kind of looking at the median home price, I mean, you've priced out a significant amount of the population um, from being able to to afford uh, that particular house. So how do we make uh, Austin affordable? Uh, the first thing is allow builders to, to build. Um, you know, if they're entitled to a certain type of, you know, zoning, whether it be SF2, SF3, or SF1, they should be allowed to, to build to whatever the law says that they, they can build. What often happens is, you know, they say, oh, well, you know, this will be great. You can build to SF2 and, you know, or SF1, which is your standard, you know, kind of cookie cutter, cookie cutter suburb home. Um, but don't forget, we have these design codes and building standards and criteria manuals that you also have to, to, to abide by. And uh, um, that adds additional regulatory hurdles uh, to it. A great example, there's a city, I, it's actually not Austin, but I won't say their name, there's a city uh, to the north of us that uh, requires um, that uh, you build uh, masonry up to a certain number of feet. And then when you get to a certain number of feet, uh, you have to have an inspector come out, and the inspector comes out and says, okay, you're building it correctly to the right specifications, uh, now you can continue. And usually there's a, a huge waiting period. Uh, as a result of that. Uh, I'll kind of move a little quicker. The other thing is fixing the process for private uh, development subsidized housing. As I said, everything that we deal with is the same thing that any subsidized or, or nonprofit has to deal with when building their homes. Um, and again, the difference is we can increase our prices to compensate, but they can't. And so that becomes a very difficult problem because they have to deal with the same increased land costs that we do. They have to deal with the same regulations. And I, mean, I talked to one council member about, you know, for PUD zoning, um, that they needed to look at maybe an expedited permitting process to kind of add an additional layer of benefit um, to get those affordable units that they're wanting. And their response was, it's, no, we're just going to mandate it. Um, the other thing is, is that the code should encourage and direct, not restrict and mandate development. I think Austin is such a great example of government overreaching way too much and getting into our lives and into the daily business and inner workings of our industry. The code is a crazy, crazy problem here. And the fact that we basically created an industry of permit processors whose sole purpose is, retired Austin, City of Austin employees, mind you, whose sole purpose is to make sure that the permit gets from point A to point B in a fast and efficient manner. And the fact that that industry has now been created by the City of Austin, in essence, uh, is a big concerning to what we're facing. So uh, that's kind of what I talk about. And so, yeah, thank you. Our last speaker is Phyllis Snodgrass. During uh, Mrs. Snodgrass's 17-year 
career at the Chamber of Commerce. She served as president and CEO of three local chambers. She spent four years as the COO of the Greater Austin Chamber of Commerce before coming into her current role as CEO of the Austin Habitat for Humanity, where she plans to maximize Austin Habitat's impact on the most critical issue of today's community, which is affordability. Ms. Nongrass. Thank you. And I normally have somebody do this for me, so uh, we're going to try really hard to actually do it myself. Which button is it? Pointing it the wrong way. Oh, that, that see, that I'm mean? pointing it the wrong way. That starts you out with. That you are yeah, awesome. Thank you. So he's been doing this a lot longer than I have, and obviously much better at it. So Jeffrey and I visited before today, and I'm really glad we did because when he finished, he pretty much already wrote what I needed to talk about. So I'm going to kind of talk a little bit about um, the things that impact Austin Habitat and, and habitats in general. I don't know how many of you have had some experience with habitats and kind of know, thank you, for a, lot, a lot of folks out there uh, are great supporters and kind of know what we do. Um, a little bit about habitat. Habitats have been around. Uh, habitat for Humanity International started about 40 years ago. Austin's habitat started about 30 years ago. You know, and, it, and, and I came to habitat for many years uh, at local chambers and then even a year with the Texas Association of Business working very closely with Bill Hammond. I know many of you are wondering how did that happen and then I came here uh, and when I, he was actually one of my references for this job and he said go work with the angels so uh, give him a lot of credit for that but you know I'm, there's nothing that's been said so far that I disagree with so let's start there. Um, and so you're, you're, you got a very business-minded person who spent 16 years as a CPA in real estate accounting and then 17 years in the chamber world supporting business, now coming in trying to figure out how to do really good stuff with businesses out in the community and with government. And uh, it is a challenge. It's, it's a big challenge. Uh, and, and what am I facing? I mean, I'm facing a situation that already exists. Uh, people can't get in the homes in Austin and the ones that are here can't stay in them. Uh, and it's like Jeffrey, I'm still living in San Marcos when I was running the chamber there. I can't afford to sell my house and move here because it'd cost about three times as much. Uh, and, and so I'm just going to deal a little bit about the very simple upfront cost of a house. Obviously, you know, we're building houses. Habitat is a land developer. We, we're, we do construction. We do uh, the mortgages, you know, so we're the banker. Uh, we've also got a new product called Home Base that serves a little bit higher median family income. A Habitat family is a 40 to 60 percent of median family income family, and uh, Home Base serves up to 80 percent. And I'm and I'm arguing that we probably need to move up to about 110 percent of median family income because if you step back a minute, median family income in Austin for a family of two is 61,500 on up to a family of four of 83,000. When you're looking at, and we're talking median homes of 290,000, most houses in Austin are around 400,000, and then they go up from there. If you're really looking for a house in Austin, uh, you know, anywhere near where you're trying to work, you know, it's, it's a significant expense. You know, where does a family uh, get that kind of money? And then we look at our families. Uh, um, 40% median family income, that's a somebody, a family of two making 24000 up to a family of four making about 33000 You're talking about 80%, our new home-based model, f median family income, that's a family of two making 49000 And that's a family of four making up to 66400 What goes, I'm going to go back to that in a minute, but just kind of trying to put a framework around what, what are these people actually making, because we hear all these numbers, MFI, MFI, but what does that actually mean? Um, you know, but there's three pieces to uh, any project. There's materials, labor, and land. Habitat's been building homes a really long time, so we, we kind of have this part down on our Habitat homes. We kind of know how to do it. I mean, we know how to build them. We've got a model that works. We figured this stuff out with the city. We do the same thing over and over and over again. Uh, we still pay for expediters, though, in the city of Austin <laughs> ourselves to get through the process a little bit faster. Uh, and we can kind of control our material costs. There's a lot of great business people that donate things to help us keep those costs down. Uh, we get a lot of volunteer labor. We get over 9,000 hours of volunteer labor a year. So we have a lot of labor that goes into these homes. We have electricians that are retired, semi-retired, a lot of great people that help us for free. That keeps our price down. The land is the piece 
that's killing us. Uh, since 2005, uh, land values in Austin, and you can see that, that middle zone going up 35 and kind of around where our offices are on Ben White, have increased 370%. Um, we have a piece of, of land uh, over in East Austin that we bought. Um, Carly, what year was that that we bought that? 1997. 1997 uh, for $22,000, and it's now worth? 1.1 million. <laughs> And we're trying to figure out how to put dense housing on it. <laughs> because we're going to obviously have to go up because, you know, you can't put two, three uh, single-family homes on, on something like that. So, um, yeah. It, and I've worked on the other side. I've brought the businesses here. I've worked for the Austin Chamber. We've gone to California, so we know it's expensive there. Come here. And they did. And that's great. And we have, what, 155 people moving here a day, and that's fantastic. And we have great jobs for people here. But I'm um, going to talk a little bit about the working poor. Uh, this is the cost uh, to build a house. There's, there's obviously uh, the biggest cost is time. Uh, it takes us a year to get all the permits together before we can even start the development process. You know, we, from, from us going and finding a piece of land to develop on, assuming we can find some, and we manage to, good people sometimes donate it. Sometimes somebody says, hey, I've got this land. We know you need to get some houses. Here you go. It takes a year just to pull all the permits and get all that ready so we can actually start. And then we've got to develop it, you know, so that you can you can get, you know, houses too. You've got to get streets in there and all the other infrastructure. And then three to five years for building. Um, you know, right now the mayor, who's thankfully hugely a supportive of affordability, is going, get people in homes, help these Onion Creek families. I'm like, you don't understand. It takes three years. You know, I don't have inventory sitting out here. And it takes time. And then we qualify the families we work with them. I mean, we have a very low foreclosure rate. Habitat families have some tremendous success stories because they're able to build equity and build a life because we're able to get them in a home. But, you know, it's just it's simple. I mean, there's we don't, we're not building more land, but we're certainly bringing more people to Austin. I'm not even looking at my notes, Carly. You'd be proud. So, uh, so there's these ongoing costs. Home prices are, are skyrocketing, obviously. A lot of, lot of factors. And, you know, I, I'm a fair market value, I mean, a fair markets person. I mean, I believe in the free market system. I believe in, in, in people getting out there and competing. But uh, there's a lot of reasons why home prices are skyrocketing. Part of, a large part of it's due to the land costs, and a large part of it's due to the permitting. And so uh, it's really twofold. And some of the land cost is due to the permitting. Uh, and, you know, I just got to face where we're at today. I mean, I, you know, I've got folks like Jeffrey over here that are going to actually fix it for me. Um, and then we've got, you know, household incomes obviously just aren't rising that fast. So, you know, we, we all know household incomes have been steady for a while. And so I'm going to look at rental and then housing. But, you know, the rental reality is... Is, let's just go in the middle between the habitat and home-based home. I mean, these, these folks would qualify for a habitat home that family's earning 34600 a year. Two-bedroom medium median price, two-bedroom, is thirteen ninety a month. I mean, that's half of their income going towards rent. And you know how rent is, too, that continues to go up. Um, you know, you get booted out of one place, you have to go to another. It's just not a really good solution. Uh, and who is this family. You know, housekeepers that work in our hotels in Austin, look how many hotels we have downtown. The hoteliers are huge supporters of Habitat because they're employees that service us. The, the folks here at the Hilton, Robert Watson, the general manager, great friend, huge supporter because he wants to get his people in Habitat homes. They're having to increasingly move farther and further away to get here. They don't have the public transportation, then they have trouble with cars, then they can't. I mean, it impacts employers. It impacts people running businesses who need their employees to get to downtown Austin. General laborers make about 29000 That's 39% of median family income. Taxi drivers make about 32000 Auto mechanics average $36,000 here in Austin. Firefighters make about 42000 here in Austin. Teachers make about 46000 The school districts and other partner they're getting, we're going to start working with to try to find ways to get them in homes. If the same family wants to purchase a home in Austin, you know, let's say the median price Austin home, and I mean, it goes up every day. Let's say it's 270000 and there's not a lot of those out there, I'll promise you. 
a family of three that's earning 50% of median family income is going to, it's, the mortgage itself is going to take 40, 46% of their income uh, if just for a standard mortgage. That's, and then think about this, then they have to come up with the down payment. Where's a family like that going to find the $27,000 to get into the house in the first place? Even when we're doing 80% of median family income homes with our home-based project, and we're actually able to bring that housing price down with the partnerships and the things we're able to put together down to about 175,000, seemingly more affordable, um, but they've still got to come up with 17,000 for a down payment. And I've got one family in particular, I'll share the uh, story with you, that qualified, took us forever through permitting to get the darn house built. By the time we got him in the house, or ready to get him in the house, he no longer qualified because he was now making too much money to get into the program. If he worked all this overtime, trying to save up for the 17,000 he needed for the down payment. So I mean, even though we're trying to figure some of these things out, we're finding even our own well-intentioned models have some consequences. And so we're having to work through that and figure out how can we do that? Do we have to find a way to get down payment assistance for people? Uh, because we've got Habitat families that have had real changes in their lives. Um, I'm going to divert a minute, but um, just to give a, a picture of a real person, we have a lady, uh, and I've gotten to meet her in person. She came to Habitat 25 years ago, and uh, she didn't have her GED. She um, wanted to own a home. Her kids, she bounced around from apartment to apartment, didn't speak real good English. She. Uh, worked, she qualified, she worked really hard, put that 300 hours of sweat equity in, qualified, built up her credit, got into this home, uh, she paid it off last year. She has since then gone on and gotten her GED. She went on and got her bachelor's degree. There's something about building up credit, owning something, making something for your family, you know, building a life, the thing that we all love to do, did that for her family. She went on and got her bachelor's. She's a teacher at Pflugerville. She's gone on and gotten her master's. And now she's thinking about getting her doctorate. And all of her kids have gone to college. And, and Habitat Stories, and that's why I came here and love it, is it's, it's one family after another after another. It's not a single story. It's, it's really impactful because it's, it's a hand up, not a handout. They really are. They're part of the process. And when you're done, you've, you've really created impact. It, you know, it's not the perfect solution, but we're not in a perfect world. And sometimes we have to deal in a community with the cards we're dealt with and try to come up with solutions that work. And it also gets people to understand that they're real people. Uh, the people that, that volunteer and work alongside them get to know these families. And, you know, when they're in the home, then they know them. Yeah. Uh-huh. Sure. That's exactly right. I was going to get to that in a minute. So this is another issue: is a is a percentage of the the home price is taxes. I mean, we because we're getting them into the home, um, you know, at a, at a lower price, we're able to deal with that for a while. And we've actually got some special agreements with the Travis County Taxing District uh, on the new home-based homes, where we're we're holding affordability to a. a the, the increase in appreciation that they can that they can get to uh, to two percent a year. So we're trying some unique things to try to keep that tax down a little bit, uh, but we can't 100 percent control it. We do have Habitat families that have been in homes for 22 years that have got them paid off, and now the taxes are more than their home payments ever were, and that's a whole other issue we're going to talk about in just a second. Um, so Austin homeowners who can't afford their property taxes is 28%. And it's not even just our Habitat families. I and mean, we've got, Habitat does, does, we build homes, but we also do critical home repairs intended to keep people in homes that can't afford to. There's a lot of folks, especially elderly, that are in homes and don't have enough to, to keep them up so that they don't have to move out. And we've come in and do all kinds of critical home repairs with volunteers sometimes uh, to try to keep them in those homes because of the taxes. Because we can't necessarily solve the tax problem, but we're trying to have them not be forced out of their homes. So what are we doing? I mean, you know, we're looking at innovative housing design, and it's really important that the houses we build are on less and less land because land is getting more and more expensive. Uh, so we are having to look at denser housing. We're looking at other habitats across the country, and what are they doing that's effective? Um, we're looking at all, all these alternative financing models. Uh, density is going to be huge for us. We're, we're um, 
looking at alternative ownership structures for these homes, even talking to folks that are doing cooperative arrangements. Um, we're looking at affordability districts, and you know, I'm I'm, I'm not zoning fan number one, uh, but I've also lived in Victoria, Texas. It was my hometown, so I can talk about it. And um, you know, that was no zoning. Zoning was the four-letter word in Victoria, and that that wasn't necessarily a good thing either, because it actually destroyed values for people because there weren't there were no protections about what went next door to you. So, you know, having some protection about what what goes next door to you can be good, um, but at the same time. You know, what we're having right now in, in East Austin is, you know, for years nobody wanted to go there because it was the other side of 35 and now everybody's going there and the folks that could live affordably and work downtown and service all these service industries downtown can't do it anymore. And so uh, we're looking at how can we do some preservation within that area, but, but do it in a way that makes sense. Um, Public-private partnerships with local employers is another great way. I mean, my preference in a perfect world would be we work with businesses, we 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 have we have good people, they put it in. We you know we don't even have to go to government. I, mean, I don't like writing for grants. I mean, our habitat was the first habitat in the country to build a restore. It's a, a resale operation uh, that finances our operations, and I have this vision that we're going to grow it, we're going to expand it, we're going to have multiple locations. And we're going to be bringing in millions of dollars a year in revenue from things that people would have tossed in the dump anyway, and that's going to help pay for it. So, I mean, it's, you know, we aren't the kind of organization that's just looking for handouts either, but, um, but it's a complex problem. And there are a lot of different sides to it, and uh, I just say don't forget the families because they are the working poor. Uh, they are the people that, that we need for the services that we need in our lives, and so we want to make sure we get homes for them. Thank you. So we've moved on to the Q&A part of our panel. However, I am going to exercise moderator's discretion, and I am going to ask the first question. I'm going to play a little bit of the devil's advocate, since we seem to have a very strong agreement that regulations as they currently exist in Austin and in other cities that mo take the Austin model and not the Texas model have an adverse effect on affordability. My question kind of goes back to what was discussed yesterday at one of the local governance panels. Now, the origin of zoning looks quite different than the type of zoning we have today in Austin and cities across uh, Texas. It was much simpler, and it was also focused on the old common law nuisance doctrine. We also spoke a bit with Luke Metzner from Environment Texas, and he spoke a little bit about the spillover effect from certain private use of property that can adversely affect other homeowners or property owners in the region. So my question to the panel is, is there a place for zoning or regulation, and to what extent? Well, I've looked at zoning regimes all over the country, and generally when zoning is considered to be flexible and uh, people can come in and easily get the zoning changed, there isn't a big impact on housing affordability. It's when it becomes inflexible. And unfortunately, uh, zoning tends to give people a feeling of entitlement that, oh, this land is zoned that way, so I'm entitled to have it kept that way. Even if I don't live there, I pass by there once in a while, so I'm entitled to have it kept that way forever. And pretty soon you get this, uh, uh, they call it NIMBY, but uh, really uh, it's uh, just an anti-growth, anti-change attitude. And that kind of inflexibility is what really causes the problems. I would prefer to not have zoning, and I would prefer the Houston model, which is where you have homeowner associations and protective covenants. Now, those aren't perfect, but uh, they work a lot better, and they work democratically. Uh, in Houston, if you live in a neighborhood that doesn't have uh, deed restrictions or a homeowner association, you can petition your neighbors, and if 75% agree, you can form a homeowner association and write those restrictions. If you have restrictions and somebody wants to redevelop your neighborhood, they can come in and they can just buy you off. They can, you know, convince 75% of your neighbors to change your rules. And that happens. So it's a flexible system, it's a responsive system, and it's very local. Uh, you have, you and your neighbors have absolute say over your neighborhood, but you have no say over the next neighborhood over, and so there's no uh, uh, external, external impacts with, that happen with the zoning system when pretty soon you feel like you're entitled to have a say over 
everybody's how everybody's private land in the state is used, as it happens in California and Oregon. Uh, I, I would agree somewhat to an extent with with, with Randall. Uh, I think it's a, I think zoning actually is is an essential part to how we do business, especially because you know, it helps ensure that your your values on your home are 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 protected. Um, you know, there are in Austin instances where you know it, it kind of becomes a little too excessive. I, I don't think that. Uh, well, the Houston model works for Houston. I don't think it's something you could pick up and lift elsewhere. I know that if you put it, especially here in Austin, with the type of neighborhood associations we have, um, you know, it would probably end up being worse because you do have instances where a neighborhood association in East Austin um, has a problem with something that a neighborhood association in Central Austin is doing, and they will fight each other and the developer and builder to get whatever it is that they want. And so, uh, you know, I think having a flexible model that's more importantly predictable. Um, you know, is, is really a way to work. And again, you just look at the city of Austin one on, on how not to do it. But neighborhood associations and homeowner associations are two different things. Neighborhood associations tend to be rather large. Homeowner associations tend to have an average of about 200 homes in them. So they're small, uh, everybody knows each other face to face, uh, and you know, nobody makes a decision without everybody else knowing what that decision is. Whereas the neighborhood associations are large and the people who are making the decisions are a small clique that nobody in the neighborhood is really aware of. Um, and I would say yes and no in Austin because we got some small neighborhood associations with well, a whole lot of bite. And um, I've I've been in in Jeffrey's shoes and we've in in our organizations when I worked at the Austin Chamber worked hand in hand. In fact, um, I worked very closely with Mr. Zucker and held lots of uh, permitting uh, task force meetings with with businesses and developers trying to build here and and heard him firsthand tell us it was the worst one he'd seen in the country which really wasn't a surprise to us at the time, um, and and heard lots and lots of horror stories the last two years. Uh, so, uh, you know, it, we we have we have a situation here where I mean, you know, I think Houston, um, you know, one of the issues I had in Victoria was we modeled ourselves at, after Houston, and 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 I actually I mean I actually think they've gone a little bit to the extreme because it was at a, at a, at a time there were anything goes there and. Um, I don't know if you know the story of the U.S. Olympics thinking about coming to Houston, but they thought about going to Houston, and, and their report back to Houston was, um, and I use this as, an, as a reason to get Keep Victoria Beautiful brought back to life, uh, was that um, they said, you know, we can't come to Houston because you're ugly and we can't bring the world to see your ugliness. That was really painful. And I, I mean, you know, they said, you've got everything we need. I mean, they had all the stuff. They had the hotels, they had the restaurants, they had the culture, they had the wonderful people. But they, they just, because they let anything go anywhere, there were just some pretty, not so pretty places. And so, you know, there's a balance. There's, this is, you know, I, I, don't, I don't love zoning. I'm not a big fan of it. I am all about free markets, but, but there has to be a balance. Uh, we are just at way at the extreme end of the pendulum in Austin, and so you know we're dealing with with that. All right. With that, I open the floor to questions from the audience. Uh, Byron, I, I'm curious to hear, especially the local perspective. Austin a year ago switched to single member districts, having ten of them around the city. Do y'all think that has changed any of the conversation in the city of Austin to look at the question of affordability and the root cause of affordability, as y'all both touched on, being in what the city is currently doing? I, I would say the, the conversation is healthier than it was. Uh, when we had, uh, when before we had these, these districts, uh, a lot of the folks that were, that were on city council all lived downtown, walked to work, didn't deal with traffic, didn't really deal with some of the stuff, and they, they frankly didn't understand what some of these issues were because they were so far removed from it. And so, you know, we do, we have people now that are experiencing this, that are in the neighborhoods that are experiencing this. And so it's a much healthier discussion. I mean, it's, it's painful, yes. We get all these new people that don't even know Robert's rules of order. I mean, it's taken months just to get them to understand how to run the meetings. But, but that's just a part of a growth. You know, we all knew that. The first year was going to be painful. But that's my, my impression is that it, it's a good thing. 
Yeah, I'll definitely agree with Phyllis in that it is a lot healthier what we're seeing. Um, the, the main difficulty we're kind of dealing with is in addition to just the, the growing pains is also you have two very distinct voices. You have people who want to focus on pr uh, providing more uh, subsidized housing, which is an important part of the market, and then you have groups of people who want to provide a variety of housing options and a variety of housing prices. And I, our wor my worry is, is that we're going to see a situation where we have all the subsidized housing for low-income families, you know, in the world, but, you know, the people in the middle, you know, your, your families, you know, with a middle income and median income aren't going to be able to afford, in, you know, living in Austin, and so they'll end up in what I like to call the donut, which is basically everywhere but Austin. Where we live. Where we live. <laughs> Other questions? I wonder if you can comment on a Houston issue, the Ashby High Rise case, where there was a lawsuit of the local, a few local neighbors against a high rise. They ended up being able to build it, but they got 1.2 million in damages against the developer because it was a nuisance to them. And I wonder if that's got a, any precedential value anywhere else in Texas. Is that a problem that's going to be coming up in the future, or is that just a one-off case? Um. I, I don't know much about that specific case, but there there is a case that's going on right now, and I, I think it's hilarious, really. If you look at it's the English versus the city of Austin. It's this family from Houston who built bought this home off Waller Creek, uh, Waller Street, and um, the, they went through all the permitting process that we go through. The city said, okay, you have a permit to build a pool and a patio. Go for it. And then they built the, the, the patio and the pool, and then when they were getting ready to get their certificate of occupancy, the city said, oh, wait, we issued that in as a mistake. You shouldn't have gotten those permits in the first place. You now need to remove your pool and your patio, uh, and uh, we're not going to issue your certificate of occupancy until you get it, uh, until you remove it. And then... Of course, Austin Energy and Austin Water are not going to give you service unless you have a certificate of occupancy. So it put them in this very awkward predicament, and now they're suing the city of Austin um, for that. And so, you know, I think, you know, it, and all of this was brought on by one neighborhood person who filed a complaint with the city planning development uh, department that those permits were issued incorrectly. And so I, I think there's examples, if you look all over the state and across this country, where, you know, not just government, but there's also possibly well-meaning people, you know, feel something's a nuisance. And, you know, the reality at the end of the day is you're never going to please everyone. And so you just do the best with what you're able to. Yeah. Uh, my question's for Mr. O'Toole. You said in your presentation that single family units are actually, as far as affordability goes, the best, uh, the best deal, the best per square foot. And that seems a little counterintuitive just given, you know, on one piece of land, if you're going to put, a, if you put multiple units there, you would think it would be less. So why is that? Well, construction costs are lower per square foot, so multifamily housing is cheaper only because there's typically fewer square feet per dwelling unit in the multifamily homes than in the single-family homes. Uh, if, if you start out with really, really high land prices, then, of course, it doesn't make sense to put single-family. Usually it's going to make sense to put in multifamily. But the only reason why land prices are high is because we've artificially made them high with all these planning rules and regulations. Land should be cheap. I mean, I, I, I had somebody last night complain to me that it cost ten to $15,000 an acre to buy land here. And I'm saying, well, wait a minute. In Port Portland, it's $300,000 an acre. In California, it's a million dollars an acre. Why are you complaining about ten to $15,000 <laughs> an acre? But that's considered to be expensive here. Uh, no, which says here. to me that uh, <laughs> people here have this sense that land should be really, really cheap. It should be a, a zero part of the equation, which means that if land is that cheap, you might as well build single-family homes, and if you want to provide more affordable, affordable homes, you build smaller single-family homes instead of building a bunch of apartments that have less privacy and that most people, some people like them, but most people think are less desirable to live in than single-family homes. Uh, oh, by the way, single-family homes also use less energy per square foot than multifamily homes. So you save energy with single-family housing. 
Yeah. On that note, I also add that they're also built to very different um, code types, and you know, usually the larger multifamily requires a lot more upfront capital uh, in the first place. And you know, you look at the city of Austin. I mean, you know, all these high rises we're building, and I mean, you're, you're talking, you know, very thick concrete subfloors, and you build it up, you know, 20 stories, and it can get pretty expensive. I mean, my wife and I before we we uh, moved out to towards Dripping Springs. We lived in a, an apartment that was built to condo specifications, and you know, for South Austin, it's still a relatively expensive was an expensive apartment to, to live in. And again, part of it, I think, also is the the building specification that's required. Just curious from a legislator staff perspective. I know we got a lot of legislators and legislative staff in the room. Is there, you guys have made a compelling case for this whole crisis. Open-ended question, what advice would you give to the legislative staff in the room? I'll, I'll start. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, but, but there's a list. Um, you know, uh, help, help with permitting if, if that's possible, and I'm going to let Jeffrey speak to that because he's been thinking more about how that can work. Um, for us, there is there is land out there that you know states own that that entity municipal entities own um, that that could be developed out. I mean, I'll say we do. Yeah, you know, I said we get land. People are kind and they give it to us. It's pretty junky land a lot of times, which is one of the reasons our stuff takes so long too. Because usually there's something wrong with it. You know, we they do let us in at the end of the neighborhood, but it's the the ten lots that are the hardest to deal with, the worst slopes, the most likely to have flooding issues, you know, all those things. And so we work with them. I mean, you know, over time you can learn kind of how to deal with that. But but um, finding uh, a land, there, there, there's stuff out there that, that's just um, tied up that could be used for housing. Um, I think one of our responsibilities, though, uh, as Habitat and other, other organizations that are trying to build housing that people own and, and uh, take care of, is to build housing that doesn't look different than the other housing. I mean, I, I don't think people would mind having some Habitat homes in their neighborhood if you couldn't tell the difference when you drew, drove in. And so I think that's our charge, and that's where we're, we're really marching forward is coming up with some innovative designs, like I said, so that we can better fit into neighborhoods. And uh, we're working with a number of developers that really want to work with us. So, sure. Um, well, one of the things that Randall talked about was, you know, not giving counties the authority to write ordinances. And that's a bill that I think TML usually has filed every single session, and every single session it gets uh, killed. And I would recommend that we continue killing that because, you know, in dealing just with cities, in general, adding another layer to the overregulation would just be crazy. The other thing I would say is, you know, the city of Aust cities have a, an ordinance process that, that they pass things, but there's these other things like administrative rules and policies that don't necessarily have to follow the same rules in terms of how they're approved and how they go through council and how they go through the process. And a lot of times, those are the things that actually add the the biggest cost because those things are the things that you know you say I want. Uh, this exterior, you know, the, every home should have a visible exterior route, for example, and the visibility thing. Well, the criteria manual is the one that says the route has to be built to these specifications, and that's how you kind of you really see what the layers are. And some of those instances, they don't necessarily have to be uh, approved in the same way as an ordinance does. A lot of times, it's just a, you know, we're going to post it, and it'll be posted for six months, and then we'll have one stakeholder meeting where we'll talk to you about what we're plan on doing, we'll hear your comments and we'll file them away in a file that gets lost, you know, somewhere on our trip back to the city hall. And then uh, after that, you don't, you, you don't hear anything from it. And then, you know, six weeks later, you're at a building site where they're telling you, you have to do X, Y, and Z. Uh, I also think, you know, requiring them to uh, reach out to specific people, you know, maybe, you know, or, or that it has to be posted for a certain number of time. I think that might be a, a route that the legislature could come in and, and restrict that. And the other thing I'd say is, is a lot of times when you the city adopts a code, um, it constantly changes. Right now we're looking at uh, transferring the city of Austin from the U universal plumbing code to the international plumbing code. And it is going to be a mess um, doing that, that switch. And I think, while I think it's important to update those codes periodically, I think perhaps restricting how often they can update it. Uh, I know at the state level we just, uh, uh, institute a law. I think it was last session where they can only update. I think every 
five years, I think is what, what it is. Um, and uh, they have to have good reason to up in the state code. So if you're in the county where there's no city, um, you have to abide by, by that code. But obviously in the city of Austin, they can adopt whatever code as long as it doesn't violate state law and they can update it however often they want. And so in many instances, you know, they're adding ordinances left and right to, to address those issues. And so, you know, by putting that in place, it would allow a layer of predictability, um, which goes a long way with developers and builders. I'll also build on one final point. The Texas Public Policy Foundation highly recommends looking at regulatory takings, uh, specifically amending the Real Private Property Preservation Act. As of now, it has an exemption for cities. Uh, in case you're not aware, the Real Private Property Preservation Act says that if any government action on your property or restriction of land use reduces your property's value by at least 25%, you get reimbursed. The exemption applies to cities. Unfortunately, they're the ones who tend to do the regulations that reduce the property value that much. Like, they're really the only ones who do it. So it's a case where the exception overwhelms the rule. And so we highly recommend, there was a bill last year filed by Senator Estes, to apply that rule to cities. It's in line with the Texas Constitution. It's in line with the plain language of the U.S. Constitution. And at the very least, it would prevent uh, cities from keeping land off the market by types of up zonings or other types of areas where they said they really haven't reduced, but at the end of the day, um, it's immobile. Unfortunately, uh, we have time for one qu last question, if it's quick. Okay, I, I worked in building a good bit, good bit of the city. And um, the whole process completely from beginning to end with the city and the county has been kind of put together hodgepodge by a bunch of people, none of which were engineers or land planners, but were politicians and attorneys. And the whole thing needs to be looked at in its entirety as to whether it's logical or just one big mess. And, and the, the inefficiency and the, and the tyranny of it actually becomes outrageous. Well, eight eight years ago, with, with people who were financially difficult. I mean, if, if you're a billionaire, you can take care of these problems anyway, you know. Eight years ago, I organized a conference on these issues in Houston. And one of the things I learned was that at that time, you could buy land, get all your permits, build on it, and move in within 120 days from when you closed on the land. It's gotten a little longer since then, but not a lot in Houston. It's a lot longer here, and it's a lot longer in places like California. One of the things the legislature could do is just say to cities, you can have all the permitting processes and rules you want, but if somebody applies for a permit and they don't get that permit within two months, it's granted automatically. You have to hasten your process to some, some particular period of time. I don't know whether two months or two weeks, but some particular period of time. Right. And with that, we are going to have to close. I want to thank you for coming. Thank you.